Good evening. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of President Janet W. Eschbach and the entire Salisbury community, I welcome you to the 18th annual E. Pauline Ryle Lecture Series. I am Dr. Tom Jones, and I am the interim provost at Salisbury. This event has become a tradition at Salisbury University over the years, and it brings nationally and internationally known speakers to this campus. The speaker tonight will be addressing issues of diversity, which connects directly to Salisbury University mission and values in that diversity is one of our six core values. So we're especially proud and delighted to welcome Dr. Nieto to our campus. Once again, welcome to Salisbury University and the Ryle Lecture. It's now my honor to introduce the Dean of the Samuel W. and Marilyn C. Seidel School of Education and Professional Studies, Dr. Dennis Patanichek. Thank you, Dr. Jones. On behalf of the Seidel School of Education and Professional Studies, welcome to the Bienvenido. The Ryle Lecture exists because of the generosity of Ms. Pauline Rod, who was principal of the Campus Demonstration School for many years. That school was located in Carruthers Hall, the current home of the Education Department and the Social Work Department. In fact, Carruthers was built as the campus school, and many, many people in the Salisbury community went to grade school there. Ms. Ryle made lasting contributions to Salisbury University and the Salisbury community. As principal of the campus school, she was known as a tough disciplinarian, especially by the pupils who attended the school. Many have stories of Ms. Ryle towering over them and the fear that that instilled. They later came to realize that Ms. Ryle was showing her caring in a very demonstrative way. Her legacy, however, goes beyond the students who studied at the campus school. Thanks to the efforts of the late Dr. Morris Bosman, Ms. Ryle's wishes were transformed into this lecture series, recognized by many as one of the finest in the country. When I review the list of previous speakers on this stage, I am truly humbled with the greats of American education who came to Salisbury University and spoke to us all. The list reads like a who's who of American education. Crystal Kuykendall, Carol Ann Tomlinson, Linda darling Hammond, Salome Thomas L., Aaron Gruel, Nell Nadi, Luis Garden Acosta, Jonathan Kozel, Alfie Cohn, Herb Cole, Maxine Green, Cornell West, James Cohen. And these are about a few of the list of Ryle lectures that are listed on the back of the program. We are so pleased that so many of these speakers have addressed diversity. As Dr. Jones indicated, diversity is a part of the S3 million mission and one of its core values. And nowhere is that more important than in the Seidel School of Education and Professional Studies. We look at diversity not as obligation, but as opportunity. My thanks to all who made this event possible, especially members of the Ryle Committee and its chair, Dr. Laura Morosco. Here is Dr. Morosco who will introduce our guest. Thank you, Dean Patanichek. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce our distinguished Ryle lecturer. But before doing so, I need to um, share some uh, spotlight with the people who really put this all together. First of all, I'd like to know by a show of hands, how many of you have seen the latest Pirates of the Caribbean? How many of you stayed for the credits and saw what happened to the dog? Oh, see, you missed the part. That's why I'm giving the credit first. Make sure you all stay and know who's responsible for this, and you're going to have to see Pirates of the Caribbean again. And nobody, everybody who saw it, don't tell. OK, um, first of all, I would like the Ryle Committee to stand, please. Mr. Ted Gilt, uh, Dr. Ted Gilty, Dr. Claudia Petty, uh, Dr. Ken Miller, and Dr. Diana Wagner. Thank you for being my support.
all of the things that you see around you, um, the lighting, the stage props, the ferns, the programs, the videotaping that's going on, uh, the tech support to make the PowerPoint presentation possible, uh, the people at catering who are going to provide us with a wonderful reception afterwards and who provided a dinner ahead of time, uh, for the uh, motor pool people who had a car ready to go, for the police who put the parking in uh, position so that we could drive right up and, you know, these days it's pretty great to have a cone so you can park. Um, so thanks to the university committee, um, all, all throughout the university, all of the different committees and staffs who really worked hard to make this possible. This is just not a one-time event. This happens twice a year, and it's really nice to know that my back is covered with all of the support university-wide. Tonight's um, speaker is a person whom I've known for 10 years and five hours. And I say that because I picked up Dr. Nieto at the airport five hours ago, but I have known her through her writings for over 10 years. Her second edition of her now classic book, Affirming Diversity, was a book at the University of Colorado that I used for graduate students and went on to use the second, the third, the fourth edition. The fifth edition is almost finished, and I'm sure it's just going to be more wonderful than those that preceded it. But I have to tell you, those of us in education really look towards the people who build our theoretical frameworks, who build the foundation we, we, yes, have to do the strategies in the classroom, we have to do the activities, but they all need to be purposeful and they need to be based on something about who we are as educators and what we believe. And I owe a great deal of gratitude to Dr. Nieto for actually helping me along that path. I come from a diverse family. My, my mother's family is Native American Cherokee and my father's is immigrant Italian. So I had the advantage of coming into a, a, a world and a family that was already diverse. But I was the very first student, very first person in my entire Italian family to go to college. Nobody was there to tell me how you're supposed to do this. And I went to my grandfather because all good Italian grandchildren go to their grandfathers to find out what it is they're supposed to do in life. And my grandfather, who only had a second grade education, he said to me, Laura, you go and you study Spanish. Spanish will be a language of the world. And so I didn't question it. I went to college to study Spanish. And where I went, you also had to learn Portuguese. As an aside, I signed up for all my college classes. And my roommate, about three weeks into college, said to me, why don't any of us ever see you in the cafeteria? And I said, there is no time to eat. My whole schedule is filled. And my roommate said to me, that's impossible. Let me see your schedule. Well, you were supposed to take 35 credits your freshman year, so I signed up for all of them my fall semester. <laughs> so sometimes diversity works for you, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and I quickly learned um, how to do things. And so part of my life as an educator is really directed and has been to those first generation college students who don't know the ropes any better than I had not known them early on. When my children were little, I told them that the most beautiful word in the world was saudades. Now saudades, if you look in a Portuguese English dictionary, will say homesick. How many of you have ever been homesick? Okay, most everybody has. But when you think about that word in English, homesick, I mean, that sounds like physically getting sick. And that's not at all how you feel in your heart. Homesickness is a melancholy. It's a longing for something. And the word in Portuguese, saudades, is a word that to me sounds like your heart crying for something. It, it may or may not attain. Just say the word, saudades. See how soft it is and melancholy it is? Now say homesick. homesick. See what I am saying? Okay, so I told all four of my children that it was the most beautiful word in the world. My oldest daughter, Sarita, was in Puerto Rico, 
and her fiance took her to this Portuguese restaurant. And the owner, who was also serving as the maitre d' that night, said to her, are you Portuguese? And she said, no, but my mother has told us the most beautiful word in the world is Portuguese. Well, just then another couple came in, and so he had to leave the table and go attend to them. But he couldn't wait to get back to their table to find out what that word was. And when Sarita told him, it was saudades. Tears came to his eyes because he hadn't been back to Portugal in 35 years. One word. It's the only word she knew in Portuguese. Free drink, free dinner, and an apartment to live in once they got married. One word is all you need to make a cultural bridge. And our, our speaker tonight has been building bridges her entire professional career. She has worked uh, with government agencies. She's uh, worked with the university system. She's uh, been at, on uh, numerous boards that you can see part of her bio biography in your program. But the important thing is she lives what she writes and what she says. And I am so proud to have her on my bibliography and now to know her as a friend. Un gran placer, doctora Nieto.
But the condition of public schools today, especially those that serve the most vulnerable children, those who are Latino, African American, Native American, and poor children of all backgrounds, these are schools that are found largely in deteriorating and devastated urban and rural communities. This is of great concern to me, not simply because I was educated in such schools, but also because I am an educator, a mother, and grandmother. So what can we do about the state of education today? First, we need to understand the socio-political context of education, because schools don't exist in a vacuum. They're part of our socio-political context. And in the end, I think that the answers to the questions that I've posed this evening say a lot about who we are as a nation, what we value and believe in, and how we educate our young people. This context includes, first, the rapid turnover of new teachers. About 20% of new teachers leave during the first three years of teaching. And the rate has generally increased in the recent past. The situation has the greatest impact on students who are the most vulnerable because nearly half of all new teachers in urban public schools quit within five years. <laughs> the changing demographics in U.S. classrooms. Uh, we've already heard the word diversity, and it's something that we're living all the time. Children living in poverty, children of color, and those who speak native languages other than English are now the majority in most big cities and even in many <coughs> urbanized suburbs and in rural areas in many parts of the country. And no school, no matter how large or small, whether it's in an urban area or a tiny <coughs> hamlet, can escape this diversity. It's part of who we are as a nation. Uh, the problem is not that the demographics are changing, because the demographics have always been there. They're, they are increasing, of course. But when I went to school as a child, and that was over 50 years ago, I went to school with a very diverse group of kids in Brooklyn, New York, and we spoke many different languages. Um, but rather, I think it's our inability to deal with the changing context that's really problematic. Most pre-service teachers, as well as most teachers, are white. About 90 percent of U.S. teachers are white, monolingual English speakers. And they, when they're asked, they say they prefer to teach in schools like the ones that they attended. That is, suburban schools with a primarily white middle class and English speaking student body. Most new teachers, when asked, also say that they feel unprepared to teach in urban and urbanized suburban schools populated mainly by poor children of color and English language learners. And yet this is where most new teachers will be teaching because that's where the population is. Another context of the, uh, the so another element of the socio-political context is the widely touted achievement gap between white students and students of color, between middle class and poor children, and between native English speaking children and those who speak languages other than English. And before moving on, I'd like to suggest that the so-called achievement gap, which I always put in quotes, could just as legitimately be called the resource gap or the caring gap. The resource gap because the gap is often a result of broadly varying resources provided to young people based on their zip codes. According to the most recent funding gap report from Education Trust, for example, across the country, nearly $1,000 less is spent per student in the high poverty districts than in the most affluent districts. And in some places, the discrepancy is many thousands of dollars per student. And the caring gap, which could also be called the caring gap, because there's ample evidence that caring plays a key role in student learning. And poor children and children of color often feel uncared for and marginalized in school. And yet, we persist on calling this the quote achievement gap. Once again, we're laying the blame squarely on the children rather than on the system that created the gap in the first place. A growing standardization and bureaucratization with pressures to teach to the test influenced by No Child Left Behind and other accountability structures. This is the main question that I get as I travel around the country. How can we attend to other things when there's this tremendous pressure to teach to the test? Yet research is finding that high stakes testing, rather than increasing, increasing student learning, is actually raising dropout rates and leading to less engagement with schooling. For example, there was a study uh, uh, a couple of years ago in 18 states, and the researchers found that student learning was unchanged or it actually went down 
when high stakes testing policies were instituted. Something for all of us to pay attention to. Another element is the physical and emotional condition of public schools. Many of the schools that our uh, nation's most vulnerable children attend um, are run down and abandoned, and they receive little financial and moral support. A recent article, for example, in Education Week presented these disturbing statistics. One in four schools is overcrowded, and 3.5 million children attend schools that are in very poor or even non-operating condition. The author concluded, even as policymakers seek to improve equity and close gaps in educational outcomes, disparities in facilities send disadvantaged students a visible and unmistakable message that we care less about their education than that of their more affluent peers. Segregated schools. Gary Orfield, who many of you probably have read of the Civil Rights Project at Harvard University, has consistently and exhaustively documented that students today attend more segregated schools than at any time since the Brown versus the Board of Education decision in 1954. Latinos, and some of you may not know this, are now the most segregated group in terms of race, ethnicity, and social class. And finally, structural and social inequality. Uh, the long-standing and growing structural and social inequality that uh, result in related negative effects of poverty, joblessness, poor access to health care, not to mention the racism and hopelessness experienced by many people on a daily basis. So in short, there are dramatic inequalities in students' access to an excellent high-quality education. Inequalities that unfortunately are frequently based on race, social class, language, and other differences. So rather than doing away with these differences, in fact, schools are increasingly replicating inequality. So in spite of this dismal picture, and I don't mean to, to make you all depressed, but rather to, to understand that in spite of this dismal picture, we know that good teaching can help, although it certainly can't overcome completely the tremendous handicaps that I've mentioned, such as poverty and other social ills. But good teaching can help. Uh, there's growing research that good teachers make the single greatest difference in promoting with deterrent student achievement. For example, in the 1996 report, the National Commission on Teaching in America's Future found that what teachers know and do is one of the most important influences in what students learn. Because of the potential that they have for changing the course of students' lives, Teachers, I think, should be viewed as a national treasure. But in this difficult time for public education, they're often thought of in just very different ways, in demeaning ways that question their professionalism. <coughs> so as a result, all sorts of remedies for improving the quality of teachers have been devised, from teacher tests to lists of quote best practices, another one of my pet peeves, because I don't think that there are any such things as best practices. I think that there are good practices and interesting practices and promising practices, but not best practices for everybody in every situation. Uh, and there's also the teacher-proof curriculum and scripted curriculum. So in my talk this evening, I want to challenge these kinds of remedies as partial, as best, and, and really ineffective and, and demeaning at work. <coughs> Although I don't want to suggest that all teachers are excellent and caring and committed, I do want to say that even in the case of those who aren't, we do better to think of more positive strategies for improving our schools. Until we do, our schools won't improve and our kids won't progress and our teachers will continue to leave the profession in unprecedented numbers. So these are the concerns that led me to the project that I'd like to talk with you about this evening. And the project is called Why We Teach. And that's the, the name of my latest book. Um, but it began as a project, and in 2004, I began this, this project. Um, my goal was to ask a group of teachers who are caring, committed, and passionate about their work to write essays about why they teach. And I especially wanted to engage those who teach students of diverse backgrounds because I thought that their ideas would be beneficial for teachers, for those of us who are teacher educators, and for the public at large, because we should all be concerned about the future of public education. So the result is a book that includes reflections by 21 teachers who work in public, elementary, middle, and high schools. 
Some were new to teaching, as you'll see, one was a first year teacher. Others were veterans. One had taught for over 35 years. Most uh, teach students of diverse racial, ethnic, linguistic, and social class backgrounds. And their own backgrounds are also diverse in terms of ethnicity, race, social class, sexual orientation, life experience, and other differences. They teach in urban and suburban schools, both large and small. I knew some of them very well. Some of them were my students. Others I knew less well. And some I didn't know at all. Some were recommended by colleagues and by other teachers. One I met at a meeting, and another one I read about in a local newspaper and contacted her to see if she'd be interested in writing. But I'm convinced that they are not so different from all the teachers in our public schools, in any town um, or in any city. Because teachers such as these can be found everywhere throughout the country. So I read and analyzed their essays, and I came up with a set of characteristics or values that describe these teachers. But I want to start with a word of caution. I begin with the premise that no set of teacher qualities is comprehensive enough or true for all teachers in all contexts uh, and all time. But if we were to look for teachers with the characteristics and qualities that I'll be describing this evening, I know we will have come a long way in fulfilling the promises of a quality public education for all students. So before doing so, let me uh, first uh, review with you some of the widely acknowledged qualities of effective teachers that I gleaned from the research. that effective teachers have a solid general education background, a deep knowledge of their subject matter, familiarity with numerous pedagogical approaches, strong communication skills, and effective organization skills. I think that we can all agree that these skills are absolutely essential in good teaching, but I want to propose a different set of attitudes, dispositions, and sensibilities that can expand them, and these include qualities of the heart as well as of the head. So these are the qualities values and sensibilities of the Why We Teach teachers. The ones who wrote the essays for the Why We Teach book share the following values and sensibilities. First is a sense of mission, also solidarity with and empathy for their students, and the courage to challenge mainstream knowledge and conventional wisdom, improvisation, and a passion for social justice. So I'm going to describe each of these by providing examples from the teachers' essays. The first is a sense of mission. I think we've been doing this all evening. Okay. Um, in every case, the teachers wrote about their sense of mission as a major reason for teaching. It's this sense of mission, this elusive something that brought Bob Ansys to teaching. Bob um, had been a cinematographer for 17 years and decided that he wanted to enter a different profession, so he became a fourth grade teacher. Uh, needless to say, his first job was compensated much more than his second job. He says, with teaching I found that elusive something that challenged me intellectually, philosophically, emotionally, physically, and as I find out too late, financially. <laughs> Although the teachers describe their work as a mission, they shy away from seeing it as missionary work. They see themselves as serving the public good, but they don't describe themselves as saviors. So for example, uh, Nina Tepper is a, um, she's, she's been a teacher for about 25 years, and she writes, I teach for the youth and the future. I believe that as a teacher, I can affect the future one child at a time. And Melinda Peller and Duck, who was a teacher of the year in Massachusetts a couple of years ago, wrote, I teach because I see extraordinary possibilities in students. But having a sense of mission doesn't mean that they're completely selfless. They also realize that they benefit from teaching as well. They get a lot, of it, a lot out of it also. They, because they know, for example, that they make a difference. And for some children, a life-changing difference. And they feel very good about that. So for example, Carrie Warfield, who was uh, one of 
my students. She's an art teacher, and she calls herself a life toucher. Uh, she says, in what other job can we improve the future, share our knowledge, and learn every day? Then that's Gehaida Marquez on the bottom there. This was her first year of teaching, and she writes, as a teacher, I'm able to help others better themselves, share one of the subjects I'm passionate about. She, was an English, she is an English teacher. Interact with and learn more about others, establish different kinds of relationships, and learn more about myself while making myself stronger. All that with one job, and at the age of 23. They teach because they believe in public education. For example, Jennifer Wellborn is a science teacher in a middle school, and she writes, I teach in public school because I still believe in public education. I believe that the purpose of public school, whether it delivers or not, is to give a quality education to all kids who come through the doors. I want to be part of that lofty mission. I may be naive, but I believe that what I do day in and day out does make a difference. And there's the case of Mary Ginley. She's currently living and teaching in Florida. She was a kindergarten, first and second grade teacher for 32 years in Massachusetts. Then she taught fourth grade, uh, fifth grade rather, for four years after having been a first and second grade teacher all those years. And, uh, and now she's in Florida where she has again returned to second grade. When she taught in Holyoke, Massachusetts, which is a, a small city in western Massachusetts, where the student body is about 75% Puerto Rican and Spanish speaking. Uh, she described a letter from a for former student that she received about five years ago, over 10 years after he was in her first grade classroom. And she writes, Dear Mrs. Ginley, I don't know if you remember me. I was in your kindergarten and first grade class at the Early Childhood Center in Polio. I don't remember a lot about kindergarten, but I remember I was scared and you were nice to me. Recently, I was accepted to a specialized high school and my mom and I were celebrating. Remember my mom? She's a recovered alcoholic and she wasn't in good shape back then. Anyway, my mom told me that I owed everything to you, that you were the one who got me headed in the right direction. So she told me I should try and find you and thank you, and I did find you, and I want to thank you for all you did. I'm enclosing a picture of me in my kindergarten class. I put an arrow in case you didn't recognize me. I'm sending you one of me at the eighth grade dance we had a few weeks ago too. I hope you are well. Thank you very much for all you did. Your former student, Stephen Jackson. And then Mary writes, I looked at the pictures at the frightened little boy in the front row with an arrow pointing to him in case I really forgot him and at the young man dressed up to the eighth grade formal. Oh, Stephen, I thought, how on earth could you ever think I'd forget you? Stephen arrived one day in mid-October. I was teaching 20-something kindergarten kids in Holyoke in a tiny classroom on the second floor. Stephen had a rough start that day. While his mom was filling out the paperwork and chatting with the principal, Stephen escaped and ran out the front door. He hid behind the bushes and only came out when our secretary coaxed him out of, uh, with the promise of a cherry lollipop. So it was a tear-streaked, sticky-fingered little kid that appeared at my door around 9.30 that morning with the principal and his mom. I knelt down to talk to him. He spit at me. And then I looked at my principal with a question in my eyes. Why me? I wanted to say, but couldn't because Stephen's mom was right there. I have the most kids already, it's someone else's turn. Instead, I smiled at his mom, asked if she'd like to stay for a few minutes, and coaxed Stephen onto the road to listen to the story. Slowly, very slowly, Stephen unwrapped himself and moved to the road. When the story and singing were over and we were moving to centers, I told his mom it was probably time for her to leave. She hesitated, kissed Stephen goodbye, and headed for the door. No, he shrieked and started after her. I blocked the door and sent her on her way. He kicked me and threw his lollipop in my hair, screaming and sobbing and wailing. I scooped him up and rocked him for the next hour, watching the other five-year-olds from the rocking chair in the front of the room and silently cursing my principal, who later told me, who later told me the reason she put Stephen in my room was that he needed me. 
Stephen had a rough year. He flew into a rage without warning, turning into a miniature tornado, throwing blocks and ripping papers off the walls and catapulted around the room. He'd sit and sulk if he didn't get his way, describe in minute detail what AA meetings were like and why his mom went to them, refused to join the circle, refused to write his name, refused to share a toy. The only time he seemed calm was when I was rocking him or he was off in a corner with a picture book. I kept those kids for a second year. I remember when I was discussing this with my principal. She knew how Stephen wore me out. She knew that I walked in the room every day saying, Dear God, help me love Stephen a little more today. I could move him to another class, she offered. No, you can't. He needs the stability more than anyone else, and I can't let him think I don't want him, she said. Mary said. So first grade rolled around, and Stephen arrived the first day, grinning and glad to be back. Stephen still had his days that year, but he had mellowed, and as he began to feel safe at school and even at home, we saw a very different little boy. Toward the end of that year, he and his mom moved, and I never heard from him again until now. Foolish child to think I wouldn't remember him. <coughs> I suppose the reason I still teach after 35 years is because there are some Stevens every year who might need me. Most likely they won't write me letters. A few do. And they, might not, they may not even remember me, but I need to be there for them. School's supposed to be the great equalizer. That may be the American dream, but I have never been in a school other than the one I was in when I had Stephen where there was an active policy to make sure that every child had equal access to quality education, where every child was made to feel welcome, respected, valued, and safe. From the minute a child walks through the school doors in kindergarten, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, and the smart get smarter too. It seems schools say that everyone is valued, but when you look closely, you'll find it isn't so. Okay, solidarity with and empathy for students. I think the machine went there by itself. Uh, so we all know that relationships are at the heart of teaching. And it's problematic to place the entire responsibility for student achievement on teachers as an issue of inequality and structural barriers to racism and other biases. <laughs> oh dear. Oh, <laughs> While at the same time, I want to say how important teachers are in the lives of students. But there are structural barriers that we also need to be aware of. The, the, the um, you know, racism and the biases, the lack of resources, the poor infrastructure, the unfair bureaucratic policies, and so on. As if these things didn't matter, and they matter a great deal. So uh, as we work to change these conditions, we also need to make sure that teachers are prepared and motivated to teach the students who most need them, like Mary said. So in spite of the socio-political context that I described at the start of my talk, we also know that caring relationships are necessary, both for students and for teachers, because teachers can't teach without having those, those relationships. But solidarity with and empathy for students are not simply sentimental emotions. And I'm so glad that was mentioned about Ms. Ryle. You know, she showed her caring by being very demanding. So to me, teachers who teach society, including our own, as truth, uh, and these discourses are then produced and transmitted and kept in place by systems of power, such as universities, such as the military and the media. The result of these regimes of truth is that perspectives and realities that are different from those that are officially sanctioned tend to remain invisible. This means creating learning environments for free service teachers, and then those, those teachers creating those environments for their students so that they develop more nuanced understandings of complex issues and they learn to confront and learn from different perspectives. So an example is Mary Cowie. I know some of you are reading her book, Black Ants and Buddhists. Mary was a student of mine and is a fabulous teacher. One day, a few years ago, I ran into her and her family at Old Deerfield, which is a re reconstructed uh, colonial town in western Massachusetts. She had been on a tour and she was particularly interested in the Native American experience and how it's depicted in the museum. And she's a first and second grade teacher. After fielding many of her questions, the guide said to her, you sure ask a lot of questions. And she said, I have to, I'm a first grade teacher. 
<laughs> so the point is not simply knowing how to ask questions, but more importantly, know how to read answers and to keep questioning the answers that we hear. For teacher Elaine Stinson, um, to question conventional wisdom means to teach outside the lines. Jennifer Wellborn, who I mentioned before, is a science teacher at the middle school. And she provides a vivid example of this. It was the book, The Mismeasure of Man, by Stephen Jay Gould, that helped change how she looked at science. The book became the impetus for a unit on scientific racism and the social construction of race that she has taught every year for the past 10 years. <coughs> Uh, and she wrote, I want my students to realize that science is not the objective pursuit of knowledge that it's professed to be. I want them to understand that data may support a hypothesis that is not valid to begin with. I want them to know that correlation does not imply causality. I want them to know there are hidden variables that may affect an experiment. I want them to know about researcher bias. I want them to know all this so that when they read in the, net, in the newspaper that, quote, minority SAT scores are down, they know that these data must be due to social, economic, and political inequities in our society. They are not due to genetic, genetic inferiority. In her essay, Jennifer also wrote that she wants her students to, quote, learn to be skeptics, to differentiate between good science, bad science, and pseudoscience. And she also wants students to think about the advantages and disadvantages that race automatically confers to individuals and groups. Because according to Jennifer, quote, it is through this knowledge and dialogue that students can understand the complexity of racism in our country. Improvisation. This is Teresa Janur. She is an educator, artist, and performer. And she's written about jazz improvisation as a system of composing, but also beyond music. According to her, since she's an educator, she's a teacher of teachers. It's a way of thinking and behaving. In teaching, she sees jazz improvisation as a metaphor for creativity within structure. It means being prepared for uncertainty, both the joy and the frustration of it. And this requires a great deal of elasticity. In this same way, excellent teachers use improvisation to see beyond frameworks, rubrics, and models. But according to educator uh, Judith Baker, who was a teacher in the Boston Public Schools for about 25 years, Schools are in template heaven, <laughs> viewing templates as the end rather than the means to effective instruction. So for example, for uh, Ayla Gavins, she is a, um, a middle school teacher near Boston, and she writes that teaching means being on a moving train, because on any given day, teachers make hundreds, even thousands of decisions to keep a balance of fairness and equity. I, and she says, I'm part of something globally, nationally, and locally. That is an empowering thought, and it gives me um, a choice of contexts where I can make changes. In contrast, several years ago, this being a temper again, she's been teaching for over 25 years, she was astonished to hear another teacher boast about being on exactly the same page as the previous year in her plan book. <laughs> So as these teachers demonstrate, improvisation means learning to go beyond temp the template or even to question it, and certainly not to worry about being on the same page, exactly the same page as a year ago. Um, the next is a passion for social justice. So um, before I talk about a passion for social justice, I want to say a little bit about social justice. Um, what is it? It's often invoked, but it's rarely defined. Everybody claims to be doing it, but what exactly is it? So I want to suggest that social justice in education means four things. The first is challenging, confronting, and disrupting misconceptions, untruths, and stereotypes that lead to structural inequality and discrimination based on difference, whether that difference is race, social class, gender, uh, and any combination of, of other differences as well and providing all students with the resources necessary to become more fully human and learn to their full potential. This means material resources. I've already talked about the fact that uh, students do not have equal access to material resources in schools. This means books, curriculum, financial support, and also the human, social, and economic resources so that their families 
uh, can live with dignity. But also emotional resources. I mean, what I mean by that is a belief in their ability and worth, high expectations and rigorous demands on them, uh, the necessary social and cultural capital to negotiate the world, and a discourse and action that confront deficit ideologies about them and their communities. But it doesn't just mean giving students things. It means also drawing on the resources that students have, and those resources and talents and strengths and funds of knowledge, what um, Gonzalez and Molu have called funds of knowledge, uh, are things like their culture and their background, their experiences, the languages that they speak, rather than seeing these things as deficits, as so often happens, where children who speak another language and come into school are seen as a challenge and as having a deficit, rather than being everybody being thrilled that they're coming in speaking another language and so therefore having another way uh, to view the world. So, this is what uh, social justice means to me. And these teachers really embody it. So what does it mean? Well, Mary Ginley, uh, who I mentioned, who taught Stephen, she's taught children both in extreme poverty and, and she's taught also very privileged children. And she writes, if I just teach them how to survive in this inequitable society, how to get along, I'm doing them a tremendous disservice. Um, Ambrisa um, Lima is a, um, a bilingual teacher, was a bilingual teacher when we had bilingual education in Massachusetts. Uh, now she's an English language teacher for Cape Verdean students. She herself is Cape Verdean. And she writes, I teach because I believe that young people have rights, including the right to their identities and their languages. And she asks, is it morally right for me as a teacher to witness and students and remain quiet? Because, she says, teaching is always about power, and that is why it must also be about social justice. This is uh, um, Linda Peller and Duck, and she defines social justice as activism. So she, she wrote, while teaching at Duggan Middle School in Springfield, students enrolled in my law-related education class became actively involved in a campaign to reopen our local public library branches. Budget cuts had prompted the city to close the libraries in some neighborhoods, and my students believed this would deny them a powerful learning tool while denying the community a central gathering place and resource. So working with the Voluntary Social Activist Organization, my students and I campaigned before, during, and after school, as well as on weekends to share our message, message about the importance of neighborhood libraries to community, community leaders. Students produced a multimedia display on the role that libraries play in their lives, they learned civil rights strategies for nonviolent confrontation and they participated in demonstrations and speaking at rallies and labor meetings. They wrote to the mayor and city council and addressed parent groups and the superintendent. Our commitment to this effort and the students' hard work have resulted in a new library system and longer branch hours. Even more importantly, this collaboration has forged lifelong relationships and a sense of activism in my students. So when we say that you know, education can change the world. Yes, it can. It certainly can. Uh, this is Bill Dunn. Bill Dunn uh, is defining social justice as advocacy. Now, in his essay, Bill, who is a high school science and social studies teacher in a vocational high school, writes about the unfairness of the MCAS, which is our, you might have your own version of the high stakes test. So he writes about the unfairness of it and the unrecognized rich resources that his students have. He also teaches in Holyoke, which is, you know, about 75 percent Puerto Rican. Most of his students speak Spanish um, and uh, most of their native language. And he sees bilingualism and biculturalism as rich resources that are often just completely unrecognized. So he calls his, his essay Confessions of an Underperforming Teacher. Um, and of course, nothing could be further from the truth, but he's getting that from the underperforming schools kind of discourse. So he ends his compelling essay in this way. So why do I teach? I teach because someone has to tell my students that they are not the ones who are dumb. They need to know that only the blissfully ignorant and profoundly evil make up tests to prove that they and people like them are smart. <laughs> My students need to know that poverty does not equal stupidity and that surviving a bleak, dismal childhood makes you strong and tough and beautiful in ways that only survivors, 
survivors of similar environments can appreciate and understand. I teach because my students need to know that in their struggle to acquire a second language, they participate in one of the most difficult human feats. My students also need to know that four days of reading in a second language under high stakes testing conditions would shut down even Einstein's brain. I teach because my students need to know that right and wrong are relative to one's culture and that even these definitions become laughable over time. I teach because the people who make up these tests don't know these things, or worse, they do. So Bill's sentiments describe a policy climate that we're all living in today, a climate at both the state and the national levels that's characterized by a profound disrespect for teachers, especially teachers of poor students, students of color, and students for whom English is a second language. So what can we learn from the why we teach teachers? One thing is clear from these teachers, we need to go beyond the current reforms that focus only on certification tests, on increasing teacher subject matter knowledge, or on giving them a few more tricks of the trade in their classroom. I think these things are important. They need to have a great deal of subject matter knowledge, of course. They need to go to know pedagogy. These are important and necessary, but they're not enough. Subject matter knowledge is important, but if teachers don't learn how to question that subject matter knowledge, they end up reproducing conventional wisdom and encouraging students to do the same. Knowing pedagogy is also important, but if teachers don't develop meaningful relationships with their students of all backgrounds, no amount of pedagogical strategies will help them develop relationships with their students. If they don't understand the life and death implications of the work that they do, no amount of certification requirements or tricks of the trade will help them. Um, we rarely find words such as love, hope, or public good in current educational discourse, yet these are some of the things that these excellent, caring, and committed teachers talked about. And although social justice and democracy, which were at the heart of these teachers' essays, do spring up in conversations about education today, they're not as common in practice or policy. Excuse me.
but it's terribly undervalued, undercompensated, and under-respected. And we see signs of this everywhere. I've known teachers who take second jobs as cashiers in convenience stores. Uh, they clean houses during their summer vacation. They spend hundreds and sometimes thousands of dollars a year on classroom materials, and they spend even more on their own continuing education, usually with little or no compensation from their school districts or the state. Yet the current policy climate at both state and national levels is permeated by profound disrespect for teachers, especially the teachers in urban schools, and also for the kids and children that they teach. Most politicians, for example, although they speak often about education, have rarely stepped foot in school. They tend to stress only accountability, and the tone they use to speak about teachers is sometimes disparaging and unforgiving. But things such as first-year signing bonuses, or teacher tests, or high-stakes tests, none of these can take the place of a true and enduring respect for teachers. So another thing these teachers remind of is, uh, remind us of uh, is this, that no amount of best practices will keep teachers engaged or committed. Uh, current reforms in education that focus on recruiting, quote, highly qualified teachers and on developing, quote, best practices and antidotes are unlikely to solve the problem facing the profession. The work of the widely teach teachers illustrates that rather than focus on just humanizing best practices, we need to focus on students and those who can best teach them. So, um, okay. So, how do we reclaim the public good? Given the current demoralizing climate in education, um, I've become convinced that we need to think more deeply about the public good. Now, this is a term that we hear less and less these days. What does it mean to have public schools in a democracy? It's certainly not what we see today. Our public schools are becoming more segregated and unequal, with excellent uh, suburban schools, public suburban schools for some, and dilapidated decayed urban and rural schools for many others. The old cliche about the has and the have nots is today more true than it has been for a long time. Is this for public good or for private gain? It's my contention that we need to forge a more generous vision of public education, and we need to do so now. Unless we take action on behalf of our public schools, particularly those that serve the most impoverished children, we continue to develop into a nation of have and have nots, and we'll do this more rapidly and dramatically than ever. And I think public schools are at the very center of turning, of turning this around. A tremendous challenge lies ahead for us. If we're as concerned about education as we say we are, and it's always on the front page of the newspaper, then we need to do more to change the conditions faced by teachers and their students, especially those in underfinanced schools. We need to support those teachers who love their students, who find creative ways to teach them, and who do so under difficult circumstances. We need to celebrate teachers who are as excited about their own learning as they are about learning with their students. And we need to champion those teachers who value their students' families and find respectful ways to work with them. Uh, above all, we need to expect and demand that all teachers do these things because the children in our public schools deserve no less. Thank you very much.